ให้กูยืมเองโอเครับชูเราไปแฟนส์ส่วนนี้ before we start we have uh, this is a pilot at Chicago event um, before we we start this presentation uh, we have something to announce a couple of topics All right. Uh, from this slide, you guys can give you guys a, a preview of our upcoming events. So in next month's July, we are going to talk about uh, something about the uh, NLP from Scott. And in August, Sherry will bring up some machine learning models deep dive. And in September, uh, we are happy to invite uh, David to talk about a really useful tool to install from uh, my OS. And you guys can see that in October, November, and December is still empty. So we are uh, eager to recruit the speakers in those three months. So if anybody, anybody has interest about, about that, please reach out to me or reach out to uh, Daniel over there, whatever you want. I really, really appreciate it. And next topic is um, so uh, I believe uh, the people from our community may receive a survey uh, two weeks ago. And we, that, that survey is actually designed for the purpose that to, um, for, for as organizer, we really want to uh, improve this, uh, this platform. And we, will, we, we really would like to uh, adapt and change, keep changing this uh, content and uh, you know, to, to keep that up to date and then benefit back to this community. We already got that many response. It's really, really intuitive, useful, and give great uh, feedback. And that uh, we also found some uh, talented people who's really uh, you know, willing to bring out their knowledge. So uh, you know, if you guys would have time, we really, really appreciate that you can take like five minutes to fill out this form, and that will be really support uh, the organizers coming to develop and to move on. So uh, that is what I'm just going to say that uh, Daniel and I, uh, by uh, check the feedback, we got some ideas to improve our content in the future. And uh, we are going to announce in the upcoming month uh, to add some new components to this uh, high data event. And uh, our goal is that currently we are hoping that once per month. And our ending goal is to do that once per week by do, doing much per week, we're adding definitely some different uh, components. We are thinking about it's uh, one uh, section is uh, for the beginners. For beginners who is really want to uh, start their maybe just an interest in learning data science, or maybe want to switch their career and doesn't know how to start. And there's a, you know in this market a lot of pricey uh, options. But the way we would like to do a uh, just a jump start of totally free version for the beginners to jump start. And another component we would like to add on to this Occupied uh, Chicago is uh, called uh, Community Coding. So uh, that idea is uh, we will bring up uh, group workshops and to build it together. And this, the topics will be driven by you. So maybe just uh, doing some analysis, doing some Kaggle competition, or doing some interesting software developing regarding to data science. Uh, that is something that will, will be very exciting for people who like to sometimes right, really want to learn together, build together, or someone would like to add some you know, uh, experience to their resume. So this is also a, a great chance for them to engage in. And again, uh, for, for those adding competence, it's, uh, we definitely would like to get the support from this community. So if anybody uh, who has a, ever has a chance or experience or suggestions or have interest of that uh, involving to those components, being that or you know, if some otherwise, just really uh, reach out to me, Daniel, whenever you want. Just really like to get the feedback from this community. Um, the third topic is uh, we have a very exciting news for, for everyone that about the location, uh, which I just got the, the good news today. Actually, I'm changing my topic. Uh, the topic was that 
where is the nice location, right? Because uh, we got uh, uh, support from Everty since February. And that is uh, six months, it's not a contract, it's six months uh, sponsorship. July is supposed to be the last one. Um, myself, I believe mean, February is really lucky in this place and this environment. And I got really exciting news from here today that uh, Everty is going to sponsor us until the end of this year. So we will do that until the summer. Thank you. The last topic from my side is uh, uh, since the well treatment to build a sharing information regarding to that uh, data science platform. As we always mentioning, um, if everybody would like to announce any job opportunities or any internship or uh, whatever things regarding to data science, uh, this is a great chance for us. So, does anybody right now have any things you'd like to share, like uh, opportunities, jobs? Excuse me. So, um, hi, my name is Chad. I work as a product manager at Bitcoin Company just across the street called Beam Bitcoin, and we're hiring a senior software developer. Just so you guys know. So, if you know Python, PHP, Tornado, the other and the resources. Thank you. So, you know, anything you need, you can send information to me, we can post that to the app later. So I believe we will get a more maximum exposure to this company. Thanks for that. Okay, I will uh, transfer to uh, Daniel, he's going to introduce today's presentation. Thanks, Steve. Um, so just real quick, uh, we are very excited that Arity has agreed to extend it. Um, just to clarify, from right now, it's an extension of our monthly meetings, these expert presentations that we host, that's going to go on through the end of the year. The other topics that G mentioned, those are things that we're kind of spitballing right now and trying to think about how we would work that out. So those are things to come in the future. But I'm really excited right now to introduce Neil Coleman. He's a senior Python engineer. Data scientist, sorry, senior data scientist here at Arity. He's going to talk to you about the opportunities here and just what a great place it is for here. Thanks, Daniel. And thanks, everybody, for showing up tonight. Um, I guess since we're hosting, we get to uh, get a captive audience to pitch jobs to for a little bit. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Arity, what we do, and uh, then I'll tell you if you find it interesting, there's going to be a tour at the, at the end. And, uh, where you can find our job postings because we're recruiting pretty heavily right now. Arity is a wholly owned subsidiary of Allstate, the insurance company. Allstate started DriveWise, uh, a program where you plug a little device into your car and uh, you, Allstate learns about how you drive. And it turns out that uh, how you drive is pretty related to how risky you are. You know, if, you, if you're swerving around and slamming on the brakes all the time, it turns out that you know, maybe you get more car accidents, and that's, of course, pretty interesting to an insurance company. So uh, it turns out that also when you're tracking um, driving behavior uh, for hundreds of thousands and millions of people, uh, you get a lot of data, which means that you need scientists to science all of that data. And so that's where Arity comes from, that's where Arity comes in. Um, all, all state leadership said, hey, what are we going to do with all this data? Uh, let's, let's turn around, let's build some products based on what we can learn and sell it, right? In business, make money, make products, create value in the world. So uh, leadership stood up uh, four different areas within Arity uh, that are focused on creating data science products and selling them, uh, creating value from them, selling them to um, different areas of the economy. Uh, there's insurance solutions. You, when you get really good at predicting insurance risk, it turns out you might be able to uh, pull some market share from other insurance companies um, and, and help them out that way. Um, so insurance solutions creates insurance models that sells to uh, other insurance companies. Uh, there's shared mobility solutions. Uh, if you know how people drive, maybe this is interesting to companies like Zipcar, Uber, Lyft, 
Um, so the suite of products built around uh, driving data, data science, and, and uh, marketed to that particular uh, sector of the economy. Um, there's consumer experiences. Uh, if you have data coming in from a device about the internal state of the car, uh, people, maybe they're interested in learning about how their driving is risky. Maybe people are interested in learning, oh, your, trans your transmission is going to fall out of your car in about six months. You know, the, the kind of information you can get from a device in a car. And so you need data science to all, all, that, all that data that we're pulling in from uh, OBD2 devices and uh, wrapping that up in a consumer app. And that's, uh, uh, that data science is the heart of the consumer experiences product team. Already. And lastly, um, it turns out patterns of where people are driving, uh, how much they're driving. Uh, this is interesting to all sorts of other companies, like city governments. This is the uh, data as a service uh, vertical that takes in, um, that looks at all the data that everybody brings in uh, from various sources of, of telematics data and uh, tries to understand what other value is there that we can create from, the, from this data. What insights can we gain that are valuable to people and, and build products around that? Um, so, that's Arity in a nutshell. Those are our different product areas. Uh, we're doing a lot of really interesting work. We're growing pretty heavily. Um, and I'm not sure what exactly leadership's target is, but it's more than, probably more than five new data scientists this year. It's, uh, we're, we're, we're planning, we're recruiting pretty heavily. Uh, if you're interested, you like what you see here, you like what you just heard, um, check us out, arity.com. Um, there's also, I believe, some uh, Pamphlets at the front desk by where you signed up. Thanks, everybody, and uh, enjoy the presentation. Uh, just to reiterate, there is going to be a, a tour of Arity, so it's a great place to see. I mean, it seems like an awesome place for it. So, anybody who might be interested, I recommend going see that tour after the presentation. So, it's my pleasure to introduce Harish Ramachandran. Uh, Harish, just, he's today's presenter. He just graduated with his master's in. Uh, computer science from the Illinois Institute of Technology, and when you when I was looking at his resume, it really struck me that he's kind of standing with his feet in both sides of the data spectrum, from the data engineering to the data science, and I think that's a real important talent. I'm going to just say right from the get-go, he just graduated, so he is looking for a job, and I think it's really important, whether you are a data engineer or a data scientist, having that ability to communicate on both sides is a key a value in order to be able to create a full team and a cohesive team that can work together. So he's actually interested in anything that's data related. He's done a lot of research both in uh, natural language extraction or text extraction, but he's also worked in the Internet of Things, working at Expertive on gathering uh, information from Fitbits and things like that. So uh, I encourage anybody to check out his angel.co uh, pro profile. It shows a lot of different research things that he's done, and it'll just speak to the diversity of opportunities that he's ready and willing to tackle. Um, so today he's actually going to talk not on just one form of language extraction, but two projects of language extraction. One will be around uh, caloria, understanding caloric uh, values in foods and how that impacts behavioral choices, and then the other one is looking at the news media and the choices of words that news media is doing. So this is a really exciting uh, opportunity and help me in welcoming her to Friday. Okay, so hi everyone, how are you? Can you hear me? Okay, so let's get started. So my name is Harish, and uh, today we are going to see about two of my XMind projects. Okay, so uh, Daniel pretty much explained all about me. Uh, so I recently graduated from Illinois Institute of Technology with a master's degree in computer science. And uh, my interests are playing with data, and learning new technologies, and uh, kind of a foodie here. So, and one of my projects is related to that. <laughs> so you'll see, see it in the later sessions. And if you want to know more about my projects, so yeah, angel.co is one way to know. And uh, this is my uh, GitHub page. You can uh, you can know more about me over here. Okay. So our agenda for today is we are going to talk uh, general, uh, we're going to go for a general introduction to text mining and then we'll move on to some basic, basic cases of industrial applications of how this text mining is used and then we'll move on to my first project that is the impact of English choice of words 
the news articles in our society, and then we then move on to our second project, which is uh, the effect of FDA's current on policy on restaurant industry. And in the end, we'll see what this A-B testing is and how we can apply this to uh, the project, that, uh, the project two. So let's get started. So text mining. So a general introduction about text mining is like, uh, it is a way of extracting useful information. And also you get, you, you can also get a hidden information from the text. So this is what the text mining is all about. And uh, usually the data here is, uh, you know, kind, kind of a bunch of words. Whereas in data, in, I mean data in other domain have some nice distinct feature. So, uh, so in case of text mining, uh, it becomes hard to directly build a model that can directly infer from the text. So we need to do a, a kind of pre-processing to get to a, a data which can be used for a model. Okay, so uh, just three uh, inter, uh, industrial applications. So fraud detection. Uh, so in case of insurance companies, uh, uh, they combine the results of text analysis with some structured data and then they see whether they climb, uh, but they investigate their climb and see whether it's fraud or not. That's one base case of uh, uh, fraud reduction and then even in the retail industry, they, they look deeper at the uh, customer product and service issues and then they try to uh, build a uh, better product and then improve their customer service. And the last case is the social media. So social media nowadays has a lot of uh, uh, unstructured data, and uh, even even they have data that tracks all your activities, even from the, the movement of your mouse to the clicks. So in, in, in here you get a lot of unstructured text data, and they use it to extract your opinions and sentiments, and uh, they see how it is uh, affecting their products. And also companies use this to analyze and predict the, uh, the, the customer needs. So that, that way it also helps both the stakeholders. Okay, so this is a basic text processing pipeline which you're going to use in both my pro the projects. So initially we start with the data source. So the data source that we're going to deal with here is like any kind of data, text data. So either you can get it from the database or it can be also from a dot csv file which is like an excel like sheet file and then we move on to a formatting stage which we can use it for our later stages of analysis and then the third stage is the uh, basic i mean uh, data processing stage where we do a various steps like say tokenization and then stop word removal and then we do stemming so i'll explain detailing uh, more about this in the in the slides in the upcoming slides so so once we get the process data what we do is uh, we use the analytics and we build our model and then we visualize the data to, uh, to the... So it's better to visualize the data rather than just like putting up with some one value. So because it's the, uh, a picture says thousand words, uh, so a picture is one thousand words, so it's better to have a visualization plot to showcase your results. Okay, so let's jump into the project. And, uh, yeah, so. The first project is uh, impact of linguistic choice of words in news articles in our society. So you can see all the code, source code, so you can access all the source code from the GitHub repo over here. So okay, so now why? So why this project? Uh, so I would like to tell a, mo a little more about me. So I'm a person who can live without a, a cup of coffee, but not without, I mean, without a cup of coffee, but not without a sip of news. So being an avid news reader, I, uh, I started to observe something across all these news web pages. Uh, so, so they all tell the same story. Uh, so what they do is they all tell the same story, but not exactly in the same way. So, that's, so if you read some story from some news website, that has a different impact than the same story that you read in another news website. So it has both positive and uh, kind of a negative emotional impact on you. And also, uh, these are the talks. Uh, so the talk, so Professor uh, uh, Lira Burwiski uh, walked on how, uh, the research, like how languages shape the way we think. And then also there's an activist called uh, Mary Page who also walked on how the words we use affect the way we think. So I combined these two impacts to my uh, 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 project. So, so after reading their works, I found that wordings plays an important role. So, 
since I'm exposed to news, I want to see uh, see which news media gives a proper uh, news in a more positive way than uh, other news media which which gives uh, comparatively in a, in a negative language. So I built a model that gives me the names, name of the news media based on this, uh, uh, based on the wordings of the news content. So here are the target audience. So for simplicity of this project, uh, I got the data from the web page of these top five news websites based on the unique visitors count. So CNN.com and Fox News, the New York Times and Huffington Post and Reuters. So I get all the articles published on these uh, 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 news websites. So what I do is I, I scrape all these uh, uh, articles from the web page of these media houses at a particular time. And then, so it's, it's kind of like a periodic basis. I do this in a periodic basis. And I collect for, and I collected for uh, 13 months uh, to show, I mean, to showcase for this project. So this is how uh, uh, the project uh, uh, works. So you extract the data and you pre-process it and you model it and then you show the results. So in case of data extraction, it's a kind of a time-dependent data. That means I need to collect the data for each and every day. So, uh, uh, so I wrote a script which can do that. And then for data pre-processing, what it does is it converts the extracted data into some kind of data which will be used for which is, which is which will be easy for our modeling process to model it, and then the results. So uh, the model output is given to the uh, model output is shown as the visualization results. So now the data extraction. Uh, so initially, uh, I started building the project based on uh, Beautiful Soap, which is a Python package that does the web scrapping part. But then, I, what I found is, uh, um, each news media website has their own HTML definition. So it is hard, it's a challenging part to define a particular script for tracking all their news medias. So here's a Python package. So I, I, I fortunately came across this Python package. It's, it's an API built by Code Lucas. So what he did is, he did the same process for, uh, for extracting data from news articles, from news websites. So what, what he does is, uh, the name of the API is newspaper.pk. So I just need to give them the uh, uh, website name. It collects all the articles and the text information in the articles and gives it to me like a text document like this. So, so this is uh, a data I collected from Reuters.com on 22nd October 2017. So I get all the articles and all its information. So if you can see, there are the, the, there are links, URL links from which you can uh, you, from which this article has been extracted, and so you can't see it over here. It's because it's a screenshot. So this is an unstructured information. I don't think this will be of any help to us if we want to uh, solve our objective. So what we need to do is first try to first we need to convert it to a kind of structured format. And that is like this. So this is a CSV format which I which I converted, where I segregated all the data on on keywords, summary, and text title and URL. So that text document has all this information. Now the responsibility is to make it more simple and more uh, easy to visualize. We, we we can convert into a comma separated by the file, and then we can we can use it for our further processing. So these so these are the uh, uh, columns. So the one is the title, the first one, the, the title over here, the Bitcoin source to record high above six thousand dollars. So that's the title, and then you get the text information, and summarize the first few lines of the article text. The text. So that's what it is, and then the URL is uh, uh, the link from where the, these articles are extracted, and then the keywords. So these are just uh, uh, top 10 key uh, frequent words that occur in the article. But in our case, what we are going to do is we are going to go straight to the text because my concern is about the article content of the wordings inside the content of the article. So we will go. In, so we are going to only use the text uh, uh, column of that. So now the second stage is the data processing, data pre-processing. So what we do is we we tokenize and. Uh, once we tokenize, we move on to lowercase. 
And this will, I'll explain later what these are, but this is the process. Tokenize, lowercase, and then we move on to stop word removal. And then uh, uh, enchant, which is uh, to see whether it is present in my library or not. Whether it's present in, in the English dictionary or not. So let me uh, give a brief introduction about that. So, so this is how it works. This is a simple uh, uh, sample example for that. So what tokenize does, does is it chunks the words into uh, separate words. So you have a string document like that, a string text information like that, that is by the <coughs> It's a great community to learn new things. So that's the input that we get. And once we tokenize, we get a separate chunk of words. So here we use the delimiter, that is space as the delimiter to chunk it into uh, each and every uh, words. And then once we are done with that, we use that tokenized words and convert to, uh, to a single case. Um, so why do we need to do this is like, we know the difference, uh, we, we, we know there's no difference between uh, capital C community and the small C community, but the mission or, or the, the system doesn't understand the exact difference between uh, those two things. So we need to make sure that we are, we are on the same, uh, same line. So, so we need to make sure that every case is small. So once we do that, in our case, we move to the stop word removal. So stop word removal is nothing but uh, uh, th those words that does not contribute uh, any significant uh, uh, meaning to the sentence. So if you can see over there, uh, Pirate, Pirate at Chicago is a great community to learn new things. Is You can get the same information from this without those stop words. So those are like connecting words. So once you do the stop word removal, you will get a, 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 a we will get this five data Chicago great community learning things. So those are the words, and then so this is a new uh, package for Python, which uh, which sees whether your word is in, in the English dictionary or not. So if you do the process from the uh, uh, stop word remove, so from here, and we move on to the uh, next process that is enchant. We 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 remove those words that are not in the dictionary. So, Pilot is removed and Chicago is removed. So this is what we get. So, uh, so the outcome is simple. You get the raw data and you convert to the data that you want to have. So there are different ways of doing this. So this is the way that I did. And why it's very important is there are words that are not very important for our, for our analysis. And also it makes the process much faster because like if you, if you can see like it almost reduces 50 percentage of the, uh, the data. So once you get the data, what we'll do is uh, <coughs> model, we build a data modeling around that. So here in this case, what I did is uh, I built a lexicon-based approach. So what it does is uh, we use a affin, affin system. So what affin is, a, uh, what affin is nothing uh, but a dictionary which is created with the words and its emotional ratings. So affin is named after a person. So who manually uh, did the whole process? So for example, uh, in this, so you can access the text file uh, at the right bottom over here. So if you open the text file, this is what you see. You have a word, and you have an emotional content for the word, emotional value for the word. So for here, abandon has minus two, and death has minus two. And if you take outstanding, it is a plus five. So minus five is the minus five shows it's kind of the word is more extreme negativity shows kind of extreme negativity to us, and plus five shows a, a kind of extreme positivity. So that's where he built his own uh, text corpus. And often it's uh, pretty good for academic purpose sentimental analysis. So for this project, I think it's okay to use the affin based model. And once I take the affin based model to my uh, uh, data, that is the data that we got after the pre-processing stage, what we get is uh, a JSON output. So what it does is it calculates the uh, score. So I'll, I'll tell you the equation of how it does that. But this is an output that we get. So, so if I'm not wrong, this is for NewYorkTimes.com. So the data is extracted from NewYorkTimes.com on 22nd October. So the information of so how can I so how do I segregate negative and positive words is based on the affin score. Some words has a negative score, and other words have a positive score. So I segregated all those words and stored as a, a, a key value pair. So the key is the uh, the one in the string. So if you go here, so the key the key is the one or the string, and the and the, the list of 
words that you see, like the die problem or the, or, the, or, the, or the values. And once we have this information, we can use this equation. So here I'm calculating the net negative store. The same goes for the net positive score. So how, how, how do I do that? So I take all the negative words from the string negative, and then like say neg die problem. Those are the negative words, and I calculate uh, and I find its respective affinity score. So that has a predefined score, and I I, I, I do a, a addition of all these words across the articles, and then I get the negative score. And, the, and, and, and then I'm, I'm using a net normalized score. I'll tell you later why this is very useful. Uh, so basically what it does is it gets all the words in the article and finds its score and sums it up. But then it also divide, uh, it also divides, it, it normalizes with the, with the total number of words. So, so now we, process, we, <coughs> we build the model, we pre-process, now we build the model and then we need to uh, showcase our results. So this is a kind of visualization which Python community commonly uses. So they use Mac, Matplotlib, Seaboard, which are like very common in uh, Python community. But plotly, but I'm going to use the plotly because it's more kind of interactive. You have the data, the data points has its value in, in, across the uh, the plot. So if I if I show here, so this is the negative word distribution, the distribution which we calculated from the first equation that we saw. So we calculated the uh, net negative score and then. I plotted it this, uh, over here. So if you can see over here, the top green line is the foxnews.com. And then, so before that, I want to explain the axis. So the, the x-axis is the date on which the plot is made. So it's a timeline. So I started with October 6th, and then I move on till October, a normal line. So it's kind of a 30-day period. And then the y-axis is the net score. Uh, so that ranges from minus 40,000 to minus 5,000. So here you can see the Fox News has less number of negative words, but uh, but as you move down, you can see CNN having a large number of negative words. But uh, this is kind of a, a huge uh, difference, right? So so I, I took a chat, I took a uh, data exploration of seeing why is it behaving the way it is. So I, I, I went to the CNN.com. And then I opened the, the text file which I collected, and then I saw the number of articles. The number of articles are like quite double the double the number of articles on FoxNews.com. So it's pretty okay to say like okay, so they have more number of articles, so that's why they give more number of negative words. So this equation doesn't provide us with the with our objective. We want to see out of all the articles, we want to see a, a, a better. More, more positive language. So here, the occurrences are high, so that's why you're getting more negative uh, uh, values for CNN.com. So that's why I introduced the second uh, uh, scoring value, that is, you normalize it based on the number of occurrences of the words. So in case of CNN, that's going to be high, so that might turn out to be something different. So I'm going to use the, this equation for getting my results. So this is the net. Uh, sco uh, normalized score distribution and the exact is the same as the, the previous case that is the timeline from October 6th to 11th and the y-axis is the, the ratio of the I mean the net normalized score so here if you see the top one is the New York Times and next comes the Fox News and then comes the CNN.com and then in the, in, in the end you can see the Huffington Post so what it does is it's normalized with the number of words that occur in, in, in a in all the articles per day, and then it plots out the result. So that's well, that's one thing to interesting to note. The CNN is not the last. So that means they also have more number of positive words. And when we normalize with the number of words, they they seem to be pretty good with the outcome. So so as we seen from the above plot, we can infer that the New York Times plays an important role in not only conveying the news, but also in a healthy way. And after this, I find New York Times uh, you know, the best source of news for me. <laughs> so it's like a lot of recommendation, so it's something that I'm going to use. And uh, the feature scope. So there are certain uh, la uh, parts that we need to work on to make it more publishable. That is the sampling part. I take a sample for one month, so this needs to be a year-long sample to give a better representative 
uh, output. And then uh, the second point is <coughs> the model that we are using is uh, based on affin system, affin based model. So the score is uh, given by uh, uh, a person who worked on only very small uh, uh, data words. So we need to build a much more elaborate words and also we need to address the ambiguity of the words which is, which, which is not addressed in that case. And also, uh, it is, so the CNN has a lot of articles, so, but we are not exposed to all the articles. People read only a certain number of articles, so we need to see which articles they are reading and then take only those articles for our analysis. So uh, that way, like, this will be a much more uh, representative. So that is it. That's my first project here. Yeah. Any questions? So did you look at comparing the distribution of sentiment within each article compared to the distribution of sentiment across the whole uh, set of articles that each an agency uses? And my question specifically is, are they publishing some really negative articles and some really positive articles? Or is it that every single article has some balance of, of negative and positive sentimentality and they kind of keep a cons consistent balance for all of their articles? Yeah, uh, so what I did is like, uh, I want to see the exposure of what they give. So what I, so, so if we go and see the source code, I, I gave only the www.cnn.com, that's the home page of the website. So you get all kind of articles, even that includes the opinion articles. So I'm just seeing the exposure of myself, clicking on the click, and then seeing what impact it has on me. So I'm not concerned about the top of the articles, so I'm concerning all the articles and then I take the emotions of them. So that includes both opinion kind of articles, which also includes uh, you know, harsh comments and stuff like that. But I limit that thread to only one uh, uh, linkage. That is, I don't travel the web page from one side to another side. So I uh, take only those articles that are published on the home page so that I can make the, uh, uh, make, the, make the project much clearer that this is the target audience, those that look on the home page, not on the page after that. So are the articles that you chose just all the articles in a certain time period or is it like the top like like certain number of articles or how is it just all of them or uh, yeah so you see uh, so you open a web page right like you open cnn.com or reuters.com and you see the articles listed over there so I put all those articles but one thing that, that I so want on the home page so it's only at the home page okay. so my theory is like we are exposed to the home page so we click the links only on the not the links uh, not the thread of links after that. So yeah, so this newspaper 3K, is that capable of doing crawling or is it just always going to be that one page of the URL that you give it? So, so what it does is it can do the all kind of crawling. So I put the thread to be one, that is like home page, and the first article that it comes to, you can, you can put the number of threads you want, that means how, how much deeper should it go, how much deeper that it should travel the web pages. Does it filter by keyword or do you have to do that yourself? Uh, so, so what it does is I just need to provide them with the website name. Uh, so it travels to the website and does the whole uh, scrapping plot. I, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. So any other questions? Okay. So that uh, sentiment score, like how do you uh, interpret that? Like, does it range from negative one to a positive yeah. one? So if it's like a point two versus point one, like is it like double the Negative, but just that you so, interpret interpreting yeah. that score. Yeah, I get. I I, I got your question. So to repeat the question, like uh, she asked, like how do you interpret the affinity scoring system? So, so I didn't do that. So the the guy who did that researched some some bit of uh, uh, background uh, knowledge about the words, and then he built his own system. And pretty much all the academic spectrum are using this kind of model for their analysis. So I went with the, with the assumption that it's if it's good for the academic, then why not I try it for my project? So that's one of the disadvantages that uh, we need to build our own uh, uh, 
So if you're, if you're from a linguistic background, you need to begin, uh, build your own uh, choices and ranges of what the word should contain, like say minus 10 to 10 or minus 100 to 100. So that's up to you to uh, uh, do that. But since often is uh, kind of pretty good for academic purpose, so I went with that. Uh, so I have a question about the, uh, so with this if then uh, kind of scoring system, is there any way to account for like negation of positive words? So for example, if an article said there was no solution, that that would be read as like a negative score? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so the project is the wordings, right? So, so I'm much more concerned about the wordings. So if you go and uh, look at her talk by uh, Lira Boreski, who, who has recently gave, gave a tech talk, uh, so, which is like more concerned about the words that are present. So, so for example, I say uh, uh, it's not good and it's bad. Both are contextually the same. But I, I prefer it's not good to be a more appealing than it's bad. So, even though the dot plays a crucial factor over there, I, I, I want to have a, a kind of a positive feeling. Like having good is much more subconsciously making me positive than uh, the other. Hey man, uh, great presentation. Uh, I found the fact that uh, most or all the news sources were weighted negatively to, I shouldn't say be interesting, I should say confirmatory. Like, people like to hear about bad shit, if you will. Um, so, but I also have a question. If you could flip back to your normalized slide of the scores, uh, I was wondering how like the scores went from being negative to when you normalize them to be positive? So, the, uh, so if, I, if I understand your question over there, right? Those are different plots for different news medias. So, those are, and, and the x-axis are the timeline on which all these articles are collected. So if you go here, so this is that I collected on 22nd October on uh, from NewYorkTimes.com. So I get all the information from that, and I get the net outcome. That is nothing but the difference between the positive count and the negative count mm -hmm. in all the articles that is published on NewYorkTimes.com. So I get a, a score. A, I get a score which I then normalize and then they plot something like that. So if you, yeah. So if you have a negative count which is greater than the positive count, so your plot is going to have a different. Uh, Ups and downs. But if you look back to your equation slide, um, it looks like the difference between your two scores are just dividing by the total number of words, right? Yeah, that's true. So if you have a negative score, you divide it by 20,000 words, it'll still be negative. And I'm just wondering. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's true. So if you have it, uh, so what I'm doing over there is I'm summing up all the words over there. I mean, the sc scores are it's... Uh, um, oh, one's a negative score and one's a, a total score. The score and the yeah, so the score. negative, everything I'm summing up with all the... the so it's nothing but this thing. The net outcome divided by the total number of uh, words that occur in the, in the uh, web page. Gotcha. So, so some of the sources are actually positive then. Yeah, so They're not I'm, negative. You were just showing us one side was just negative. Yeah, this is one uh, just to show why we not why we should not go for uh, negative word. The oh, least number of negative words. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, thanks. So yeah, that's a great question. We'll do the last question. Council time. Hi, uh, question here. I'm, I might miss the point. That the uh, uh, how big is the data set? Like how you store the all this data? So the data is like uh, uh, kind of, for, for this I did for the month of October, so it's kind of, uh, uh, if, you, if you take the text document, it comes around 600 MB or something like that, 600 megabytes, so which is pretty small because all my data is on the text format. Uh, and Thank I use you. that for the month. Thank Alright, thanks guys. Okay, so I think you're all with me right now. So okay, let's move on to the next project that is uh, the effect of FDA's tariff on policy on the restaurant industry. So what, what is this policy? So they, they introduced this policy, uh, a few, uh, I mean, on May, I mean, last month. And uh, so what the policy says is like 
every menu that you see in a restaurant or, or in some certain retail shops, retail uh, establishments, you need to you need to ha have a menu card that shows the calorie information. Like here, you can say a uh, chicken sandwich should have a calorie information of that, and also uh, even 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 the sparkling water should have zero calories, zero calories. So you need to have all those information. So that's what the FDA has announced on May 2018. So now, uh, so I was like, so why why I need to start this project? So now, given this calorie information, I want to see uh, what effects of this new implementation has on me, or more more on customers who base their choice on base item, and then who are somewhat calorie ca conscious. So these are kind of customers that, that I, I, I'm concentrating on. So that's what like we're not going for any customers. So because like most of the people order their food on a very specific basis, but there are certain uh, people who go with the generic or more, they won't have the main item in their uh, uh, in their in their menu, and they don't care uh, what the uh, other ingredients are. So 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 if you take this slide, I uh, what I want to have is a chicken sandwich. I don't I don't care really whether it's uh, grilled or fried. So now even this calorie uh, 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 calorie policy, I want to see how it's going to affect both the customers. And if, if it affects the customers, obviously it's going to have an impact on restaurants. So because the restaurants now have to restructure their menu so that there are no significant differences in calories for similar items. So here are these two are the similar items, like grilled chicken sandwich and fried chicken sandwich. If I take chicken sandwich as one of my uh, main item. So let me explain it through an example. So I want to have a mocha frappuccino. So, I, uh, so what, what options do, ha do I have? So I have a peppermint mocha frappuccino and a mocha, mocha frappuccino blended coffee and white chocolate mocha frappuccino. So these are some of the, so you can see, uh, I will show you a demo which gives how many options we have when we go for mocha frappuccino. So but now all I care is I want to have a mocha frappuccino. I don't care about what the other part of the food item is. So how, how, I, how am I going to make my choice? So now they introduced this calorie policy, so I'm going to go with the uh, uh, less calorie and uh, going to choose the one with the least one, least calorie value. So here, here also the, it's, it's the same process that you see in project one. We extract the data and instead of pre-processing, we try to explore to get the feel of the data and then we model. So here I'm, I'm, basing, I'm going to base my model on n grams. So I, I'll show you how it works and then we move on to the results. So the data that we get are from the menustart.org. You can also find it through this link. And menustart was uh, built by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So it's okay to believe their data set, even though I didn't, I didn't manually do my whole data extraction process, so it's okay to believe their data set. And uh, it is important to know that in the data science community, there's a saying called garbage in and garbage out. And <laughs> if you have a data that is not very useful for you, I mean, if the data is wrong, you can't find any inference from the data. So it is uh, very, uh, so this is one of the prime requirement for, for any data analysis project because we, we rely on the data source. So since uh, this is uh, uh, from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, I, I took, I I've taken the data set for 2017 and I downloaded it as a CSV format. Okay, so now uh, I will uh, give you a demo of how it works. So, so this is, uh, so I, I, I wrote a Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook is the place where I can uh, you know, showcase your Python data analysis uh, project. So here, if you can see over here, we started with importing the package. So there, there are packages, but I want to talk about the pan, 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 pandas, which which is uh, uh, a data wrangling tool that uh, a Python uses. So it's similar like SQL. Uh, uh, if you're with the SQL uh, background, pandas is more similar to that, but it is easier for us to have a, a quick visualization and statistics output, which is uh, hard to get through SQL. So that's the one key advantage of Pandas, and I can talk a lot more about it. And also, uh, I can 
I, I, in the end of the slide, there's a link which you can uh, go through it later. So we'll jump into the uh, data exploration phase and see how it works. So now we, so here what I did is I collected for 2017 and 2014 and stored it as a data frame. So data frame is nothing but the table like structure. So the one that you see here is nothing but the data frame. So which is like similar to the table in SQL. Uh, <laughs> So what it is, is I collected the, the data and stored it as a data frame. <coughs> These are the uh, spy sample uh, um, data outputs. So there are many, uh, so this is like not a number. Uh, uh, so there are many not numbers, but my concern is to, you know, get. data frame and uh, we don't want everything what I'm concerned about is just the calorie and the menu item and the name of the menu item so if you can see over here the shape gives us the rows and columns right? so we have 35,000 rows and only 47 columns so these are the 47 columns and I don't really need all these columns all I need is the menu ID the restaurant the food category and the item name and the calories so this is going to be used for our uh, model building. And if you can check the uh, restaurants inside the, the data, uh, data frame, what you see is like some of the uh, some of these restaurants like Applebee's and even you can see Starbucks. It's not a restaurant but still a, 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 a retail, uh, I mean food retail establishment. So yeah, so you can see all kinds of restaurants over here. And then, so there are 94 restaurants, and what we did, or what I did is, uh, uh, want to see two different comparisons for, I want to see the behavior of 2017 and 2014, and see is there any change in the, in the calorie information. So, so here is the food category, and these are some of the food categories which you'll see later, and where we, uh, which you'll see later for where we are going to use it. So now, here what I'm going to do is, I'm going to uh, merge the uh, two data frames into a single one base, and this is how it looks. So we have the menu ID, and we have the calories, and we have the food category on which this menu, menu ID is present. So if you go up here, so if you go up here, you can see beverage, just like uh, hot coffee comes into beverage food category. So these are some of the menu items which is categorized on food categories. And then I want to see their behavior uh, with 2014 and 2017. So one thing about, uh, I wanted to talk here is I used the Seaborn, which is helpful for getting uh, uh, statistical visualizations. <coughs> so here what I did is uh, build a box plot. So a box plot is nothing but, uh, 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 so it, it contains the whole distribution of the data sorted by the uh, x value, that is the food category values. So if we take this box plot over here, this region is the first quartile. So we call these, uh, the extreme ends or the whiskers. So this whisker is the bottommost whisker, and from here to here, that's the first quartile, and from here to this line, this is the median of the, the box plot. And this is the next 25% of the data. And from when we move from here to here, we get the, the next 25. And then when we move here from here, we get the next 25 percentage. So it so what what what, I, what we'll try to infer from here is we need to see is there any uh, quite a kind of, kind of uh, significant difference from 2014 to 2017. So these are the entrees and, and soups. But if we take within that uh, uh, food category, uh, even, even if you take the burgers region, there is not that much significant difference uh, or statistically significant difference that you can infer from that. Of course, yeah, you can say uh, the median is higher over here, that is the, the, the middle, median is the central portion of the data distribution. 
So you can say that's a little bit higher, but because I can't say significantly that calorie consumption is reduced on 2,000 I can't come to a conclusion like that. But what I can say is, uh, if you take, take the, the box plot for, for, for uh, uh, toppings and ingredients, or for soup for, in, in that case, I can say that uh, for, even for 2017 and 14, this is much the, the uh, even, so even for, for, if you take the toppings and ingredients, 100 percentage of the data is always, I mean, it's going to be much lesser than uh, what we see for the bulbous region. So that's what I can infer, but I can't come, uh, find the conclusive inference from 2014 to the 2017. So might be it would be uh, better if I get 2018 data, because this law was implemented on, uh, on May 2018. So we, we can find a real good inference based on the 2018 data. So now we'll go jump into the... Uh, um, uh, we'll directly go to the model. <coughs> Before that I want to say like, so these are the mean calorie values. And we have the uh, restaurant information on the, on the x-axis, and y-axis has the mean calorie value. So if, it, if you can see, the high calorie restaurants are little, C, little, little Caesars. And <laughs> so these, these, these are the uh, information, I mean, these are the restaurants which has kind of uh, high, value, high calorie values. Uh, so this is, so what we have done so far is to explore the data and like get the feel of what it is. So that's what we have done. So now we now we, we take the 2017 data for our analysis. So we started with an uh, with an uh, uh, theory that I make my choice based on uh, main items. So that is similar items. So how do I measure my similarity is to n-grams? So n-grams is nothing but a continuous sequence of n-words. So if you can see the uh, 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 text doc, text over here, so the text contains this is a sentence, this is a text. And when I apply unigraphs, that is when n equal to one, this outputs this this output what what it outputs is this is a sentence. So these are the outputs when when I apply n graph when n is equal to one. And similarly, that goes for the y graphs also. What I get is a, a, a continuous sequence of two words. That is, this is is a, a sentence. So this is what my output is going to be. So this is what n graph is all about. And we'll see how we are going to use it in our example. So here, so here uh, we will take the case of Starbucks, and we will see how this bigram is going to affect. So I'm basing my model on bigrams. So you can project it to any kind of uh, n graph. So I'm basing my model on bigrams and see what, how, how, how these choices are going to impact the restaurant industry. So. I build the. So what I do is initially I get. I subset the data data set. Initially, I had 2017 data set. Now I subset to our choice that is those data set that has Starbucks as the restaurant name. So I do that. So it's like the select select clause in SQL, and then we move on to the. So what it does is I'm trying to build an item name and ID. So I have an item name, and I have its respective ID. So that is what it is. So it, so if I take the first element, it gives Devil's Food Donut and it gives its ID. So now this is uh, uh, the function that I built. So what it, uh, what it does is, uh, it gets the bigrams and, uh, and, and, and joins with the menu ID of that bigram. So what it does here, if you can look at the example, look at the, the first ID. So what are the bigrams from Devil's Food Donut? is Devil's Food and Food Donut. So those are the bigrams that we get from the text. And what it does, what this function does is, Based on that bigrams, it goes and searches all the menu items and see where is the devil's food or where is the food donut, and then it gets the menu item ID name ID and then it stores it as a dictionary. So this so if you so this is the example that I given. So if I take Carol Macchiato, I want to see how many menu IDs has the bigrams Carol Macchiato. So it comes out pretty large because uh, there are many many menu I mean many menu items. Which has that uh, name Calvin Macchiato, so that's a key ingredient. So, so these are the potential competitors it for restaurant information. Now, the uh, people like me or our customer customer customers are going to go with the generic name or the main name. So this, I'll so what if 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 you want me to do do that, I'll go with the least calorie value. So that's that's what this function does. So I provide. Uh, 
the function with what I want to have. So I want to have a mocha frappuccino. So that's what we saw in the first example. And then we pass it in, into a function. What it, it does is it builds a list, uh, list of item list that has mocha frappuccino and its respective calorie value. So that outputs this thing. And, and if, you, if you have the choice list of how many mocha frappuccinos the stock, stock offers, uh, you, you can see there are 194 choices that it offers. So like say peppermint mocha frappuccino, peppermint white chocolate mocha frappuccino. And that comes with almond milk or non-fat milk. So th these are all the choices that it pops up. Uh, but I base so 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 yeah, it, it keeps on going. <laughs> so if you get to the end of the slide, yeah, we'll <laughs> so if, if you get to the end of the slide, I go with the top five recommendations for my uh, mocha frappuccino. So I go with the least one that is peppermint mocha frappuccino, lemon cream, almond milk. So that is one way of approaching the problem. So this is an open problem, which you can build based on any end graphs and then see how it comes out. So, so if we go back to the slide. So this is the results that, that we can solve. So I come up with a hypothesis that some people make, make some people choice or based on end graphs. So end graphs is the main item they want to have. In my case, I use bi graphs. So and then I built an application for calorie conscious people so that they can sort it based on what they want to have. And also, I, uh, I, I, I restructured, uh, I mean, <laughs> I gave the restaurant industry about what all menus will get affected because of this similarity in choices. So this is an assumption or this is an hypothesis that I came with. So I am like perfectly okay with that, but how do, so the business or, or, or to build the product, we need to really do an hypothesis testing to really understand whether my idea is true, I mean, whether it brings out profit or it's, it's just an internal hobby project. So that brings us to the next section of A-B testing. So what A-B testing is done, done is done is like, you have two products, A and B, and you project it to the customers, the same customers, and then they, and you see how much conversion happens between A and B. So if the B gets you a higher conversion rate, you go with the B. So that's what A-B testing is. So we need to do similar kind of testing in our pro, in our uh, uh, application to make make sure that it gets a profit. Otherwise, it's of no use. So one uh, quick example is Google Google does that for for its uh, advertisement platform. So in Gmail, uh, ten years ago, they, they they want to see what color of uh, um, uh, what shade of blue they need to give for the advertisement on Gmail. So there are four, forty shades of blue. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. There are 40 shades of blue, and they literally tried with each shade of blue on, 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 and provided to the customer to see which has a higher click conversion rate. And the designers, like the, that's a very big story that you can read about in the, the Guardian website over here. So the designers chose uh, a shade of blue, which doesn't mathematically uh, gave them a, a output that gives a higher, uh, uh, you know, higher revenue. So here. The choice of designers uh, was not the success product. The statistician's outcome turned out to give a, a $200 million revenue in the ad uh, business. So, so this is like a quick thing I want to say then. So if you want to run a profitable <coughs> business, then uh, it's better to make your bets on the map rather than your emotional attachment to uh, any, any product. And, uh, so this is a problem with natural language processing. A quick, quick problem is like natural language always comes with more subjectivity into our our, our, our system. So it's hard to understand uh, what is good and what is bad. So that's one thing that people are working right now, and it's quite challenging even in the linguistic uh, uh, backgrounds. So any questions? Questions? Can you go back to that slide uh, real quick? This, which one? Oh, uh, I just wanted to, uh, uh, that was the last slide. This was the one. This looked interesting, but it seemed like you went pretty quickly. Okay, so, so what it says is like um, he's chatting with a bot, and uh, it comes out to be something funny, right? Like, But whether it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a 
did it understand and gave a output as something funny, or does it say the words something funny <laughs> as an output? So, so it's hard to understand which one is true unless you are the developer of the uh, this chatty bot. So that's so what I talk, why I gave this is the, there's a problem with natural language processing. It is hard to find uh, an objective statement from a given text data or from any kind of uh, uh, words. So it might be good for someone, or it might be the same news. I mean, if you get the news articles, it might be good for someone, but it not it not be the same for the other people. So and then if you have no questions, so you can get all the resources over here and the source code, and I posted everything in the, the resource session. I'll share it with the demo. And also, yeah, I want to thank the Pyrata community for giving me this opportunity, and also the sponsors for giving us this platform. And thank you, and our wonderful listeners. Thank you for staying all the way with me. And uh, these are some links which you can connect with me, uh, and uh, say hi in any of those links. And also, uh, currently my project is getting over on my on my university, so I'm like uh, looking for some interesting opportunities to work on. And uh, if you guys have uh, any interesting opportunities, please let me know. I'll be here for some time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. So yeah, Harish will be sharing these slides with us, um, and we'll post that to the meetup, um, as well as a link to his GitHub in case you want to grab it here. Um, so yeah, one more thanks to Harish and to Arity, and people are welcome to go for a tour or come up and talk to Harish or Mingle. Uh, just one more thanks. One more thing, sorry. I, uh, we did actually, we printed out a certificate. We wanted to find some some way to just say thank you for our presenters. We really appreciate the people putting in effort for this. So, Harish, you are the official recipient of the first I think a certificate. Thank you very much. We have another announcement. So if you are interested in taking a tour, you can meet me in that back corner right there. And then also we do have...